right. What's up, everyone? Welcome to Speed Bumps Live, episode nine. Man, Number this, nine. Uh, we're like creeping into July, which absolutely makes no sense because it was just February last week. Just saying, man. That's little, what it feels like. It's a little bizarre. How you doing, Paul? I'm doing great. How are you? Fantastic, man. Look at that. We're, we're coordinating with the white uh, pattern shirts. I don't know what's going on here. I don't know how we do this. It is uh, quite bizarre. The uh, I guess the speed bumps memo went out across the uh, the entire company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's you know we're we're gonna yeah. we're gonna work on the t-shirt one next. But uh, thanks for joining everyone. For uh, those of you guys that are joining us for the first time, Speed Bumps Live is a weekly web show that discusses marketing challenges and opportunities with leaders from different industries. And we got an awesome show today. Uh, I'm Paul. I'm Javier Santana, co-founder of Launch, uh, an experience design agency uh, here in Atlanta. Yeah, and I'm Paul Carpenter. Uh, client relations at Lion Star Films. We're a video production studio based here in Atlanta as well, focused on branded content and communications. And real quick, um, you know, before we dive into this and, and bring on our, our guest today, uh, do want to mention that uh, while we do have the chat feature off each and every week, we do have the Q&A and we're going to be doing Q&A. So please, as uh, we're going through this uh, th these topics, please make sure to to post your Q, uh, your questions in the box below. We've got Shannon Delaney. Say hello, Shannon. Woo! All right, and so we're she's gonna come on board and uh, ask some of your great questions. Uh, and so let's just kind of kick it off. Hob, you wanna introduce awesome. our guest? Yeah, so today's guest is Glenn Caruso. And uh, I always feel like when I introduce Glenn, I want to do the, the movie guy, like in a world, you know, like it has to be really dramatic. <clears throat> but uh, Glenn is a digital transformation specialist, uh, customer experience advisor and educator. Um, he's always been on the forefront of emerging technologies uh, for marketing and advertising. Uh, he's, he had days at AOL. I mean, he's worked at uh, agencies um, back in the 80s. Uh, he started his own digital media company that was acquired by Blink-Q. Uh, Blink Media, sorry. Uh, now he's at Adobe. He's been a part of the rise of digital marketing for the last 20 years. Uh, he's leading financial service industry, helping uh, to uh, demystify the complex MarTech landscape and help marketers understand the benefits of next-gen marketing tools. He's also doing, at, at a collegiate level, serving as an adjunct professor and advisor to students at UGA. Um, I need some help. Um, I'm going to be, <laughs> I'm going to be uh, asking Glenn to just uh, like educate me a little bit. Wow, this is going to be a great yeah. show. Uh, Glenn, uh, we'd love for you to join us. Here I, look, there, there we go. How's that? <laughs> That's fantastic. Nice to see you, everybody. Thanks for having me today. I can't wait to hear what I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> and we're off. And we're off. So, you know. <laughs> So let me ask this. Let's go ahead and get started and, and just talk a little bit about your history uh, before going into topic of around digital transformation. Let's hear a little bit more about your early days in digital, uh, how you got into digital since you started on the traditional sure. side um, yeah. and, you know, and, and how you've seen the evolution go and how has that like, really helped your career? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I started, I went to University of Missouri. I got an advertising uh, degree. And I started out in New York and just as a media planner at uh, J. Walter Thompson. But um, this was the mid 80s and we started seeing the rise of cable where it actually had uh, started to reach over 65 percent of the 65 um, percent uh, of U.S. households. And sort of what I've always been, I've always tried to look for where the ball is is flying. I've, I'm just I'm just somebody who's very interested in seeing what people are doing and what what they're doing in their industry and at that time it's there's so many parallels Javier like you said at that time cable was new media right they didn't have a budget for it and you had to convince them and you know it all went back to and it still goes back to really for marketing customer experience and what we see is as different technologies media technologies and marketing technologies grew you kept getting a better customer experience so I wound up moving I wound up moving from the agency side to Turner Broadcasting to start t selling cable for TBS, TNT, um, uh, sports and entertainment. And at that time, it was the same kind of, um, it was the same kind of, we had the same kind of stock, uh, sticking points that we have now with clients. They didn't want to move into uh, 
into cable and they didn't want to move uh, they didn't want to move into something they didn't know so there was a lot of education and that happened in the early 90s and then I moved to weather.com which was one of uh, one of the largest uh, uh, single websites in the world at the time and I was selling what was in 1994 online advertising and that's when if you had a button that said on your static on your static banner 468 by 60 that said click 10% of the people clicked on it because it said click here. Why not? <laughs> but, but so it was interesting. And then what I did was I wound up going to the next generation uh, in the late nineties. I went to Yahoo and then to AOL because portals were so big. Yahoo, yeah. a AOL and, and MSN, uh, MSN.com, which I later sold were accounting for 85% of all the web traffic. And then things started to change because with that, with, with those properties, we started to see the rise of a better customer experience with behavioral targeting, with addressable targeting. And so it was really cool. So the experience is getting better. Then moved on to um, a company called Takoda, which was bought by, by AOL, and it was behavioral, deeply, deeply behavioral targeting based on what people were viewing. And that was next generation. Later, we moved on to programmatic with uh, demand side platforms and DMPs and Facebook, selling Facebook, like you said, Javier, through, through Blink Media, which was acquired by Gannett, by USA Today. So we start seeing like even in the 2010s when I'm selling Facebook with such a robust ability to target, at that time there were 200 um, uh, demographic, psychographic, uh, and geographic uh, elements on any given page. Now there's millions on any given right. Facebook profile. But we started using search technology within Blink to help target to help target ads better on Facebook. And this is in 2010 where again, people were like, what is this? I don't believe in it. So all along, like don't believe in cable educational system. Don't believe in digital advertising at all with AOL or Yahoo, moved them into that. Don't believe, you know, don't believe in, in Facebook. It's too new. Um, well, nobody wants I remember to I, jump in it, right? Everybody wants to wait. Exactly. See. You take the risk. Exactly. If you fail and if you don't fail, then I'll go ahead and jump in. And it's just then like I'll go, behavior, exactly. Right? exactly. Exactly. And then really it went into SaaS and marketing technology and MarTech stacks and ad tech stacks, at which allowed us to give even a better customer experience across all platforms, omni-channel, real-time, utilizing, stitching together every bit of data. So, you know, when we think about it, all marketing starts with the experience. Are we, are we developing creative that's visually appealing, that has a message that makes me want to click, and does it really pay off on the end? And that's what we're able to do now with MarTech because it's all run on uh, AI and machine learning. And it gives you the ability to go uh, from the birth of a marketing message, like with, with me at Adobe, with Adobe Creative Cloud and Acrobat and Photoshop, from the moment a marketer creates in those tools and then activates into analytics and tags every bit of creative with analytics, delivers it seg through segmentation with a DMP. Ours is called Audience Manager. And then really, um, using just using other technology technologies to create a better customer experience so we, we you know people talk about crm management but it we think at adobe more about customer experience management right it's are we getting what we want because what we find is especially with millennial well actually every every age group every demographic with millennials 70 percent of millennials will abandon a brand if they don't have the a good experience with it. Now with COVID, what we're seeing is everything has to be digital. You really have to get into your digital transformation efforts because people can't walk into stores. They can't walk into banks or walk into an AT&T store. So I think I've always, I've just seen, it was interesting to see the parallels because it's always, it's always trying to drag these traditional marketers who don't understand and you know, why do things different until we absolutely have? Why did yeah. newspapers die? They waited too long. We're making more money from print than the site. We're making more newspapers. We're making more money, not as much money, a lot less money. Oh my God, 
the digital side is is kicking our butt. Let's get into digital. Right. It's too. It's yeah. too late. Just really, really funny thing that somebody uh, told me one time that I cracked up. They said uh, digital transformation means oh shit, we got to catch up. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh gosh, yeah. And and what's funny, it like to that point is like uh, we got to catch up. And and something that Paul we were talking about when we were prepping for this talked about we complacency. Up. Oh. We prepped. We yeah. Prep. It should have. First time we sure prepped, man. What are you talking about, man? I know. It's and like the audience is saying they prepped. It sure as heck doesn't seem like it. <laughs> no. So. <laughs> We did, we did. I swear, yeah, people yeah. out there, people in the uh, interweb sphere, as my dad would say, on the interweb. But what, we were talking about complacency, or the are marketers yeah. complacent? I, first, I thought, yeah, they are, and then I, I, and then I thought, actually, the more I thought about, it, no, they aren't. It's not so much that they're complacent. Um, people hate change, so they are they're complacent in that way. But more. Moreover, I think they don't know what to do. How do you implement digital transformation? Right. Which is, is really behind, behind digital transformation is what's called DDOM. For those I hadn't heard about it until a couple of years ago, it's data-driven operating models. And what we're finding now with the robust amount of data that's out there that can be stitched together for second and third party, every marketing decision must be driven by data KPIs for the marketer for each division within the marketing department must have individual KPIs that they're, they're held to because data tells the real story. It's no longer like the old days of advertising where this brilliant creative director created three versions of the commercial. They are the end all be all. Now we can do A-B testing like right. with our products at Adobe Target. So it's like how do we jump into a data-driven operating model and how do we have, what is the people, the process and the technology, which is what it comes back to, how is that gonna be deployed? Where, where do I start? And I know at Adobe and many of the big consultancies, um, they're helping, including yours, uh, Javier, they're helping with roadmaps and, and getting people on the right track. Because they realize it's, it's obviously much more efficient to do things digitally and and, and I'll end here on this point. Um, something that we noticed in the financial services industry, did you know when a person walks into a bank and does any average transaction, it costs the bank $55. And this is for the human person, the lights, cleaning people, the building, the commercial space, and all that, it's $55. If they do that same interaction online, it's six cents. Wow. Six cents. One thousand times more efficient. And now you can't walk into a bank. You can't walk into AT&T or Verizon stores. So actually what a lot of businesses are seeing, those who are digitally transformed are seeing higher revenue right now. Because even though they can't walk, customers and prospects can't walk into the store, the thousand times efficiency of online it's just incredible. And now, like you said, we must digitally transform. There is no option. It's actually probably sped our business, what we do, ahead three or four years because people are realizing it's, it's really our only option. And when we had to do it, efficiency is there. Same with people working at home. Finally, companies are saying, holy moly, they're more efficient during COVID and everything that's happening by working at home. Imagine if it was just a normal day, 50% of our workforce could work from home. I can cut my commercial space in half. I don't even have to pay for that. So all of this is playing into it and it's actually very good for us. And it's good for brands because like you said, it drags new brands into the, into the, uh, into the water into the, uh, to start really experimenting with digital transformation. Yeah. Um, Litter, you, you over-prepared in so many ways because you really just knocked out about three of our topics. So yeah. um, I hope, hope everybody enjoyed the show. Uh, okay. We'll see you next Bye -bye. week. No, <laughs> no now, now we move into the SAS Comedy Hour. I know, right? Featuring Paul Carpenter. And no, you don't want that.
No, listen, uh, you're, you've hit on so many things in this that, are, that seem to be a common thread across a lot of the marketing leaders we've had on our show. And I've heard risk. Um, first off, why did you even get into digital is curious yeah. to me, but we've heard yeah. risk. We've heard the experience comes first. Um, yeah. And this goes back, like this is a common theme to all speed bumpers out there. Uh, take a little risk. Make sure the, the experience is top notch because nothing else yeah. matters after that. But then I kind of want to dive into, all right, why did you get into digital? But now, like, let's fast forward uh, since the time you invented the internet um, <laughs> <laughs> and, get to, and get to the point of what is typically that first step with some of your clients to get them you know, kind of opening up a little bit and going, yeah, we need to, we need to be doing a little bit more. So I know it's kind of yeah. two different questions, no. but fire away. Yeah, no, sure. Really, you know, we have to go back and think of the basics in terms of what our customers want now and what, what they want is multi-device, you know, messaging. Most people, 50, like over 50% of people use their cell phone, no surprise. Right. Cell phone is their major, uh, their, uh, their computing device, their most often used computing device, but they tend to switch between different, different devices. So they go from the tap, the phone to the tablet, and they, they continue the journey throughout different channels. So we, they have to think about multi-channel orchestration of the message, and they have to think about mobile first because people are using mobile and then how do we deliver a better message quickly? So, I mean, this is what we've got to think about in the background because these are our common, you know, what we commonly run into. And like you said, Paul, it's all about customized content, not even for like we used to do for a broad segment. We're talking about one-to-one -one personalization so that Paul, even though Paul and Javier are demographically, psychographically, geographically so similar in common, Paul is still going to want you actually might prefer and engage with, with marketing that has a blue background. And Javier will engage with that same message more if it has a red background. I mean, it's, and that's one data point of the millions of data points we have. So thinking about all that, how do we optimize our business? And, you know, from there, sort of like what we find is, is there are a number of different steps as we go from very low digital maturity. We have to develop the develop the people so it's people process and technology yeah. so how do we get all these people in an older mindset a, a more an older mindset to move what's going to spur them on also even your customers like with us with adobe when we moved uh the creative software like photoshop from a, uh, a cd-rom sold in best buy to a SaaS model in 2007, even our customers were like, am I gonna lose my artwork? Am I gonna lose my data? There was a lot of, we had to lower prices. We actually took a loss and knew we would and, and we had to, the other people we had to tell Wall Street, we're gonna lose money, by the way. Our revenue is gonna go down Wall Street because we're moving to SaaS, but here's why it'll ultimately go up. So the people were the customers, Wall Street, and then, of course, internally. So that was one. And then we had to figure, about, figure out how do we then, what processes do we, do we need to get involved? And I, I will uh, talk a little bit about uh, a helpful tool that Adobe has developed, and it's free. But what is the process? What's the workflow going to look like now? Because everything's been turned on end. And then lastly, what's the technology behind behind all this to prove that we're driving a data, we have a data-driven operating model, we're working on data and being held accountable to KPIs that roll up from me as somebody with hands on keyboard to my manager, to the CEO, to Wall Street, that we're actually, the technology is actually helping us keep on track and building revenue. So there is, there is, that, there is that growth curve and it, typically it takes three to five years it takes three to five years to do that, but you need to do it. And something that Adobe has that might be helpful, it's called uh, this uh, customer experience management playbook. And what it is, it's free. You can log in. And I think Paul may put the link in the 
link to that in the uh, chat box. But what that is, it's a series of short videos, modules that link together to take you through all of these different phases and help walk you through this, no matter what MarTech or AdTech you're using, but really to simplify it for you. So that might be helpful, but that's where they start. And it's not easy. It's, it's not easy unwinding other MarTech stacks, consolidating MarTech, uh, but it must be done as we're seeing now, or else you'll be left behind. Those right. companies that do have mature digital uh, transformation get more revenue, have better customer through better customer experiences. And it's interesting too because you said something um, um, in relation to going from the cellophane wrap box on a shelf with the Adobe CD yeah. to go to SaaS, right? And I mean, I'm I've been using Photoshop since version like 1.2, right? Which tells everybody my age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, but you know the 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 thing is is that software companies quickly realized that they had to focus so much on the customer experience, uh, specifically from a support standpoint, because at any given moment, if you're not supporting properly, I could just unsubscribe and go elsewhere. It's not as easy as I've oh, oh. made this significant investment into something that physical, which I now have a CD that I'm putting in my CD ROM. But you know, it's it's really interesting. I mean, there's there's a lot to talk about here. But uh, but I wanna but I wanna shift over to how you went from you know your early career you know dealing with people that were calling you know I want my MTV uh, to yeah. you know to founding an agency and selling it um, you know helping with digital transformation that helping brands navigate uh, through the digital ecosystem to understand what they what they need to be doing um, but then you also go down the uh, collegiate path where you're actually helping students prepare for this. How did that happen? Yeah. Yeah. Well, like I said, like sort of what I men mentioned before that, that plays into this is I've always been just interested in where what's happening next. And, and something that happened when I was at AOL, it was there was when we were in transition, I had about six months where I didn't really have to do much work. And this is where it all started in uh, sort of the mid 10s, like, I mean, like 2005, 2006, but I started going to lunch and dinner and I, I, I do marketing and sales, but I started going to lunches and dinners and coffees with people in all aspects of digital and internet from creative to delivery, every aspect from agencies to vendors like Adobe and Salesforce and others and Facebook and uh, as well as brands. And what I started to see is I started getting a 50,000 foot overview of everything that was happening where everyone were all so busy, were sort of siloed down. And I, that was what was exciting because I started saying, I started in my mind putting the connections together of Javier says he needs this. This is where he's having issues. Paul just has a solution for that. I met with him last week. It was sort of interesting. And the, the, the changing of the careers, my progression, my prog uh, careers was really the natural progression of advertising and that really then marketing because advertising is just pr part of price, product, promotion, placement, you know, the four or five P's of, of marketing. And that's how I, that's how I got to where I am today because it was just a natural progression. I, I sort of, it was almost like I told, I, I told someone, I go, it was almost like I was on a huge iceberg that was breaking apart and like the cable television was going into web and I jumped into that and that sort of started falling and then from into portals and then portals started falling away and started becoming programmatic and I went to the next but it was just again I, I really and this ties back to what I do with Georgia I just and this is what's on my LinkedIn profile I'm really an educator I'm really here to help and that's uh, and that's my role that's what I just love to do and what I found is uh, what I, what I, the reason I started going uh, or I went into education was because in, it was in 2005, I was in a, at an Atlanta Interactive Marketing Association event, and there was the kibitzing before the actual presentation. I said, what, and I would meet people, what do you do? I'm an interactive. What do you do? I develop ads. Yeah. The next person, what do you do? I'm an interactive. This is before, this is, uh, before it was called digital. It was you know, <laughs> from new media to interactive to digital, uh, new media to interactive to digital. But I talked to someone else and they said, I do analytics. 
what do you do? I do site creation. I do this. And I, I realized there's so much more to interactive and nobody's teaching this. This is before general assembly, which is excellent. And even Georgia has an excellent, uh, excellent program too. But I, I thought, where do we get this talent from? Because no one's, tra nobody's training anyone on this. Anyone in our business is too busy doing our business to move into education. You know what I mean? I, yeah. You know, you're, you're not old enough. You know, it's, it's, you won't make as much money going to education. But I thought we need to train talent. We need to train them now. So that's, and I, and I just love, I love mentoring people. I just love helping people get new jobs. I love, I love seeing people really realize their full potential. And so that's when I started petitioning. I was, I, uh, Jen Osman, my first, uh, from who's a, one of the, the top professors, Jennifer Osman at University of Georgia within their Terry School of Business. She actually started the first social media class. And I did sort of the same thing uh, in the Grady School of Advertising and Journalism, uh, like a parallel track. And uh, I, I would bring in specialists, Facebook and uh, Home Depot and big agencies like JWT or 22 Squared to speak and talk about where they were going. And or, or, or launch. Or launch and launch. Well, you'll be the next one. You'll be the next one. But what I wanted to show them is, especially with, like, my most recent classes have been about MarTech and AdTech, and this was a, before I started with Adobe. Now I just advise uh, occasionally in Georgia um, and help students when need be. But we started talking about MarTech, and it's so scary to students who are journalism majors, PR majors, who know a little bit about interactive but what I would do is I'd bring in specialists from the agency side, the brand side, the vendor side, and talk about all the different career opportunities there were. In, you didn't have to be a coder. You could be creative. You could be analytical. You could have different, whatever your skill was, project management, there was a role for you here. And it was a lot more, it's going to be a lot more lucrative to go into digital than to go into, no offense for those in traditional, you know, other businesses it's going to be a lot more lucrative because everything's going digital. And, um, and that's really what I found. But what I loved is, is bringing in different speakers who are luminaries in their own right, who are doing this every day. And a professor can't, you're, you're a professor. Right. Um, so even me, it's almost like I'm a facilitator. I'm a puppet master mm. as it was. <laughs> We're bringing in the right, <laughs> the, the right people to get these students excited and build their network. So that's how I got into that. That's how I got into education. Well, it, it's incredible. And I've, I've listened firsthand on some of your sessions with students earlier in the, the COVID. I was, a, I was a fly on the wall for one of your virtual sessions and it's really amazing. Um, I found another theme to all speed bumpers as well out there. We've talked about risk. We've talked about uh, experience matters. We've also talked about lifetime learners and we did that last week with yeah. Laura. And I think we've always, a lot of the, the individuals, Shannon included, who have come on have always had this yearning for learning. And yeah. I'm actually hearing you're, you have a yearning for educating and not yeah. only from the student standpoint, but it seems like the first step going back to this whole digital transformation and what you do and what you do, yeah. what you're really good at is educating the, the client and making it, yeah. making it feel more approachable that we can do this. It is three to five years. Yeah. It is hard. Yeah. You need to do it and I'm here to help you and I can educate you along the way. So um, I think that's kind of a common theme and I'm going to label you as a lifetime educator. Is that okay? And learner and learn. You can and learner because in fact, you know, even I tell my students when we have people, when we have, these folks come in, I say, what is the quality you look for? And there's plenty of jobs for, uh, well, less right now, but there's plenty of jobs for, for students in, in this business. They just don't know where to look and I can help. Um, but one of the things they look for, one of the qualities is being inquisitive and being some, and you have to be a lifetime learner and that's come out because things are changing so fast. Uh, we had um, Justin Dombrow from Google. He's one of the executives at Google here in Atlanta, 
he spoke to my class about everything Google is doing, which I learned so much. I learned, I learned so much more from my students and from the speakers. Um, but something he talked about was, he goes, when I graduated from college in 1997, he goes, Google didn't exist. And for these students, the jobs that will exist when they get out of school don't exist now or just being formulated. Mm -hmm. So that's why you have to be reading and looking. Like I get, I, I, I subscribe to Ad Exchanger and Wall Street Journal, uh, the Wall Street Journal updates, and I read it a tremendous amount, usually short form. Um, but you have to see, this is how you understand where the ball is flying, where instead of what, you know, what, they don't know what's coming. So you sort of have to put that together yourself. And it's easy. You go to, I even tell my students, go link to link to link to link and read and print out what you're seeing and start and start putting the connections together. Yeah. And some students get it. Uh, Georgia has, the students are so, are so superb and well prepared that most of them really get it. The vast majority of them get it. Yeah. And that's why they're successful. I wanted to ask, because uh, I know we're coming up on, on question time here, and hopefully everybody has started to put some questions in the Q&A box. Uh, but I kind of want to leave, before we go into that section, I want to leave with kind of a loaded question, okay? Because we're talking about what's next. Right. right? <laughs> so, you know, I know, right? With all of this, like, it's already a complex landscape, right? Mm-hmm. We're about to there, you know, the, all the talk of cookie-less environments. Oh uh, yeah. All right. So you wanna you wanna leave some nuggets here for uh, your thoughts on what uh, marketers uh, can do right now to prepare for that. Yes. Yes. Well, and it's still. I mean, it won't happen for a you know a little while, but it's important. Obviously, cookie-less is is critical to think about now. But what we're seeing, and that's really. It means there'll be less third-party data that can be shared due to um, a number of things. Google is adhering to new privacy, you know, putting self, uh, you know, they're self-regulating themselves with that. And there are also, there's a number of reasons they're doing it. But what, what this is showing is that there's a rise in, in, uh, in um, the CDP into uh, into using your own brand marketers using their own first and second party data That's and really and and really running through it because the more looking at our most lucrative customer the only reason we market the only reason we market is to um, is to is to find as many you know is to find as many of those lucrative customers you know, that map to the customers we currently have that are such high volume revenue drivers mm -hmm. and make sure that they, we can reach them at scale. We want to sell the most lucrative products we have at scale. And with this right now, you'll be able to, you know, you'll really have to dig into your own first and second party data and also use um, onboarders like LiveRamp to anonymize any third party data we have and connect it back to that user and that's what's happening now. So I, I think where there's two things, it's uh, customer data platforms are, are growing and also creating a holistic profile, a 360 degree view based on stitching together, putting all of our data to work is what one of my clients says. We wanna put all of our data to work right now and it's in different silos. So it's breaking down silos of data and then also just feeding it into feeding into your CRM, into your CDP, so that we can scale the business, scale the business against those uh, prospects that are most likely to become one of the lucrative one of the lucrative customers that we have. So start that's, building that's your right. own yeah, start building your own database if you haven't already, right? If you have right that, and also start looking into customer data platforms, there and also go. customer data platforms and how do we get a holistic, how do we unify that profile down to the individual? Because it's still in many cases, just large swaths of say, better than it used to be, but swaths of, 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 of prospects, but now it's getting down one-to-one. -one. And I would also be looking, you know, you've got to be actively talking to, 
uh, MarTech providers, whether it's Adobe or whether it's Salesforce or Oracle or any of the, and there's so many different point solutions uh, within there too. And what we're seeing is consolidation to one platform so that it's one sheet of glass so that there's no integration. There's few integrations to slow data down, which slows the ability to deliver real time in the moment, customized messaging cross channel at scale with, with immediate analytics to course correct. Yeah. We had a we had a conversation uh, earlier in the season. Paul, keep me honest here. I'm, I'm, I don't remember who it was. Yeah. It was uh, personalization versus customization. Um, uh, that was uh -huh. that was David J. That was David. Yeah, that that's right. David. He went, he went yeah. really deep into that. Um, with I mean, David is is a really interesting guy. He's got a wealth of experience. If you guys haven't seen it, go check out. That was episode two, I believe, right? Two. Yeah. So yeah. David J. Uh, comes with a lot of uh, experience around personalization and customization and he he had a lot to say about that um but it looks like we're popping in some questions uh, shannon you want to join us yeah lots of good questions actually ah. i'm gonna i'm gonna jump in with the first one i think that dovetails with what you were just talking about um so from an anonymous person we had without cookies and therefore limited third-party data how will brands who don't have any first-party data such as startup brands gather data and information about their customers. It's a zinger, huh? That's a, <laughs> it's a good one. Really <laughs> I know, I, I'm sorry, well, Glenn. You, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> Connection's bad. <laughs> or, or, or I can do what I do in, in my class. I'll say, great question. What do you think? <laughs> I act like I'm fake smoking. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll say, so this is, we're talking about uh, the person who wrote the question was a startup where they have no, they have, they have no, no data. data. Yeah. And they're basically yes. saying without cookies and limited third party data resources available to me, how am I going to get information about my customers? Well, there's a couple, I think there's a couple of ways. Uh, there's a couple of ways. One, I mean, if you've done a startup, you do have you do have data about who you think your most lucrative customers are. You've done that in the business model that you've shown to your investors. Mm -hmm. So you have, an, you have an idea there. You can still tag, you can, whether you, while you can't get third-party data, you can still tag whatever marketing messages are going, uh, going out there, whether it's through mobile or mm -hmm. desktop, tablet, wherever it's appearing. And you're able to see, you will with an analytics tool, whatever you use, whether you use Adobe Analytics, Google Analytics, Core Metrics, whatever you use, um, you'll start seeing what's actually happening. And even, um, even platforms like Pardot or um, HubSpot will, will allow you to track what's happening. And that's where you're constantly doing A-B testing. Right. So even if you don't, you don't need third-party data as much because it's not as clean um because it's third-party data okay google stop oh i have i have so many meetings just a side note i have so many meetings that i constantly have my google home setting off alarms so it'll constantly go off but i call it my robo overlord so stop it they're taking over so my so is my roomba my roomba stop looking at me like that roomba but your own you're up your own data is going to be collected over time and you're going to be able to test with A-B testing, whether you use Adobe Target or Optimizely or any of the number of, of uh, products out there at different price points for different, you know, for startups or, or any size business. So you will be able to collect. You're collecting your data because whatever you send out, if you tag it, you'll get the response immediately. And if you do A-B testing, B works better divide that in half and do A, B testing. A did better, divide it, make one change, test it again until you get uh, what's optimal. And then if you can, you know, if you get with an AI related marketing tool, it will automatically do this, uh, do this for you. Like what programmatic does with, with companies like Seismic and uh, even with AdCloud, our DSP, and, um, our DSP product. And uh, so that's how I would start. Start collecting your own first party data because you know about your customers. You know the general, what's, what's driving them. That's how you got the funding where that's why you started. And that's why you started the business. You know, there's opportunity there. I think it's also going to make everybody have to up their content game, right? 
suddenly you've got to have that really good content that's going to make people want to come to you in the first place to give you that information. And I think that's the challenge as marketers is with so much noise out there. So oh, content, Shannon, that is such a great point. Content, well, content is king. Uh, it's the, con it's the, creative, you know, if the con or queen, I'm oh, sorry, content, <laughs> content is the imperial. Um, but it is hard to create a lot of content, social media. I mean, it's social media and search yeah. because people don't believe advertising. That's why the only growth, except now with, you know, Facebook, but I mean, with, but still social media, people believe uh, messaging and, and recommendations from friends and much more than ads and search is so deep in the funnel, but creating that content, like you said, is a huge, huge issue. But yet like for social, um, uh, my friend, in fact, my friend Aaron Arnett works for a company called Vidmob, V-I-D-M-O-B. What they specialize in is content, social media content for all the platforms, Facebook and LinkedIn and TikTok and Snapchat. And what they use is, because it's so expensive to create that content at an agency, that they uh, actually use Vidmob, outsources a number of different freelancers who specialize in content like that, and it's much more affordable. But yeah, content, and, and if you don't, can't afford to create content, outsource it. And there's Vidmob is one of them. There's a number of excellent uh, uh, companies that will do that. Great. But yeah. Um, so Same. this question Same. is from uh, Late Night Calhoun. And the question is, um, now that many are moving to digital due to budget and COVID, how can a small business cut through all of the digital overload and stand out? And when you, so the digital, hello, late night, um, Calhoun, um, <laughs> how do you cut through, how do you cut, through, and what do you think they mean by like cut through the clutter, like as a, a smaller business? I mean, possibly because the perception is everything has gone digital and there's so much out there and there's so much content. Yeah. How do you cut through and make sure that you stand out when there's yeah. a lot? Well, well, what, what engages us most, what's extremely relevant to me. So that one-to-one -one personalization, how do, we, how do we put a stake in the ground and say, we know these are three audience, lucrative audience segments. How do we make this as personal as possible? What first party data, what data, whether it's first party or what you've read about, it, the reason you started the company, how can I hit those three segments that are most lucrative with the most relevant message. Here's what I think is most relevant, knowing their problems and pain points that our product will, our, our product will solve. Um, but we start with that. We start with a, the, as if you don't have access to this, start with the most customized messages you can think of for those very specific lucrative audiences and test them in AD. Because Trust me, people say, I don't look at digital ads. I guarantee you, if I served an ad to you that had a picture of your mother on it, saying your mother wants you to call them, you'd click on it. <laughs> I guarantee it. If you showed that on three pages, I guarantee it. Um, um, because it's completely relevant and personal. Your mothers are about to yell at you or tell you why haven't you called. So I think you should be able to start that. And again, it's all about learning and uh, capturing that data and seeing what, you know, to drive what you do next. Yeah. If there's one thing I can add just real quick, I know Glenn, you're the expert here. You, oh. I think you nailed it from the standpoint of late night Calhoun. Don't go against, uh, don't do the shotgun blast. Don't oh, no. compete against all the noise. Be very targeted no. in your audience and who you're trying to attract yeah. and serve up that relevant message. Get very targeted. That's how you work this, through the clutter. Well, and this is what, and I know we're at time, but this is what I tell my students who say there are no jobs out there. I sent out mm -hmm. a thousand emails to whom it may concern. By the way, Paul, call me. Where's the right. number? It's on my resume and PDF attached. But what I always say is put your stake in the ground, choose two or three companies and go deep. And it's the same thing here with marketing pick two or three segments and go deep and really under, get to understand them and their pain points and keep course correcting your, your messaging until you, you know, figure out what's working.
Well yeah, said, Glenn. Absolutely. Got time for one more? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Um, can This is from Ryan Maffitt. He wants to know if you can talk more about getting your antiquated or traditional brand partners to adopt a data-driven operations model. Um, he was asking specifically huh. around financial services, but I would imagine that applies probably to most yeah. industries. Yeah. Well, and, and this is, I'm assuming they're from an agency trying to get the brand to, to could move be. to. I think to, it could be written as done. a brand partner, but I would um, almost say inside of a company, it could be your How do you do? brand partners, you know, inside of the organization. Essentially. Yeah, and this, yeah, well, one, they're, they're realizing, one, they're realizing, these companies are realizing we have to have a data-driven operating model, or they should be realizing, and there's always going to be a champion, and this goes back, Shannon, to the people process technology, the people portion. How do we get the different, the different divisions and the different stakeholders excited enough to launch this? What's in it for them, especially when you have stakeholders at a, a brand that say, Oh my God, this will put me out of business. I, I, and this is, this is what, what I do is totally, I do it the old way. It's like, it's why the agencies, why the agencies in the late nineties said, we don't want to move into digital. We only know traditional. Well, you, and, and that's, what's lucrative. They have to realize that you have to change or you'll die. And it's more of your, I mean, any of the big brands that are mature in digital in FinServe or any category, is what you're going to emulate and improve on. Steal shamelessly and iterate and improve in anything. Don't reinvent the wheel. But they should be reading about this. And if you're trying to convince them, figure out what motivates that unique person who uh, uh, needs to be an advocate and, and work through your organization. And some of this is also in this uh, customer experience management playbook. Again, it's free, it's okay. just look through it, it's simple modules. It'll talk to you about this. How do you get people, people process technology, how do you get people internally on board? And this is where even at Adobe, when, when we went to a digital transformation in 2007, some of the people at Adobe left because it wasn't, it wasn't you know, what they wanted to do, but it's more thing, you've sort of got to change or, or, or die. It's it, sadly. And, uh, but I mean, really understanding what motivates the people in power who need to be your advocate and circumventing that. Great answer. And, in fact, yeah. I'm getting feedback from the audience that uh, you have nailed the responses very in depth and they appreciate it. So oh, good job. Cool. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, late night Calhoun. Thank you, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget to tip your stuff. You. Yeah, right? Live, lies, all lies, right? It really <laughs> worked. Fool <laughs> them all. Hilarious. Well, there's, there's a couple of more from Ryan yep. that are very specific to financial. And Ryan, I think what we'll do is we'll send those questions to Glenn after the show and maybe yeah. you can respond just because we're coming up on time. Um, just sure. want to quickly ask you, since we didn't ask you earlier, We've, we've taken a moment to, uh, uh, to ask some of the folks um, that have been on the show, some of our guests, uh, you know, people that inspired them, people that helped them along the way. Any shout outs that you want to give to people uh, uh, that have just really helped create you? Yes, besides mom. Yes, I'll besides, besides <laughs> mom. Uh, well, the, the, the one that really inspired me the most was my old uh, manager at Weather Channel and weather.com, a man by the name of Larry McHugh. He's here in Atlanta. He's since become an angel investor and is uh, very deep into the ATDC, uh, which is part of Georgia Tech, that incubator down there. But he's the one who always said, uncover, uncover needs and problems and base your solutions around that. It's all about, it's not about features, it's about benefits. And what can you do to help make a person's life, work life, personal life less painful and just smoother? But he was the one, and he was the one who said he was, he always, he actually used, and even, and this was in the mid nineties, uh, he used a data driven operating model. He goes, understand your customers. And back then it was reading the wall street journal and reading trades. And, you know, when, when the first, um, alerts and updates came out through the, you know, through, uh, through, uh, internet, uh, the interwebs, interwebs. that's where that's, the interwebs, as my dad says, uh, that Google, that FaceTube, that U-book, uh, <laughs> my mom used to say, the FaceTube, 
Are you on the stage? La Linka de In. Um, uh, but that was, he really said, understand your customers, which is what we're doing now. And now we have so much more data. So it was Larry McHugh. So thank you, Larry. And he was also, he uh, was a great coach and mentor, just for, has been throughout my career. He was one of the best uh, professional, I'm one of the best personal friends of mine. Uh, he's just a great guy. If you don't know him, reach out to him. He says thanks for the shout out too. Oh, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> oh, is, La is Larry on the phone? He is. He's on, he's on the, uh, oh, but, I mean, on the, on yeah. the interwebs? He's on the interwebs. Hey, Larry. <laughs> Larry, I'll be expecting that $200 gift card you promised. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Holy cow. So you can go get another Bluetooth headset. That's right. <laughs> yeah, for both yes. sides. Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. Glenn, listen, um, I, I, this has been phenomenal. Uh, you know, when, whenever we get together just as friends, it's always phenomenal. But doing this yeah. and, and, and getting to know uh, or getting all of your knowledge out to our audience is uh, priceless. So thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate you joining us. Um, I think we're kind of running up on time here. So if we can wrap it up, Glenn, is there anything else you want to kind of leave anybody with? Any final moments? Well, Any final, final, final. Um, one, thank you. Thank you both for one, doing these podcasts. These are extremely helpful uh, in setting these up. And Really, anyone out there, if you need any help, if you want to, uh, you know, you have questions, feel free to email me. My email is uh, Glenn, it's Glenn, G-L-E-N, Caruso, C-A-R-U-S-O, but it's G Caruso, G-C-A-R-U-S-O, at adobe.com. And my number, and feel free to text me or call me, my number is 404-788-2008. Uh, Oh, you're so if you, uh, yeah. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Larry will call. Larry McHugh will be the first one to call me and go, you. You're going to need a burner phone. He's going to need a burner phone now. Yes. 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 <laughs> awesome. But no, I'm, I'm, here, I'm here to help. So Glenn, thank you. Appreciate thank you, you for having yeah. me on the show. No, absolutely. As always, you're dropping dimes here, man. It's awesome. Like the knowledge is just fantastic. And uh, the bubble, you know, I had to find a shirt that was as bubbly as your personality. And I don't know if I accomplished that. <laughs> and you got Javi to do the eyes. Like, you yeah, made him cry a little. My, it's yeah, always... When I, when I mm -hmm. laugh, I start to tear up, man. I've been wiping yeah, up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he did it. Yeah. So anyway, thanks so much, Glenn. We'll catch up after all of this as well. Uh, thank you to everybody who joined. As always, we are going to put this episode up on YouTube early next week. Make sure you share that with all of your network. Oh, one more thing. Uh, uh, the link, what was the tool? And we're going we're gonna to put that link in that email next week, and we'll post it, okay, Glenn? Yeah. So I have yeah. that. We'll give it out to the crowd, and uh, they'll have their little playbook and start that digital transformation. Okay. And in the okay. meantime, there is, yeah, there is that link, but there's also, if they want to go to another free resource, it's a video series, very short modules, it's Experience League. So Adobe Experience League, you can sign up for free and learn about all these different, all, all, all things related to MarTech and AdTech, as well as Adobe products, but sure. very much that, that elementary beginner level too. So if you have any employees or you want to learn, feel free to use that. We'd love to have you uh, be part of Experience League. Awesome. Who do we got next week, right. Kav? So next week, we actually have a former colleague of Glenn's, uh, Nicole Bueno. And uh, yeah. N Nicole's fantastic. Uh, she is C mm -hmm. she's CMO at Tackle.io. When, uh, when I met Glenn, when I met Nicole, they were working at User IQ. And uh, Nicole had a very interesting uh, uh, problem to solve, is that the category didn't really exist. Right, the customer success platform did not exist, so they had to figure out um, how to really market to that group. And uh, now she's moved on to tackle IO, where she has a very similar challenge. The category they're working yeah. in also doesn't it, exist really, so she's got this ability to to find these gaps, expose them, and help people understand why they need these solutions. Mm -hmm. So Nicole's fantastic. She's uh, such a pleasure to talk to. You. She's going to be with us uh, next week. And by the way, next week it is a Thursday show not a Friday show, the, uh, just because we're going into the holiday. And then we're going to take a break for a month and come back August 7th, I think, right? Yes, August 7th. 
So uh, and we'll send out a note um, to everyone. It's going to be an awesome conversation. Thank you so much, Glenn. Thank you so much Thank Shannon, you. for always being such a champion for us. Thank you, Shannon. And, uh, you know, this is going to be awesome. Thank you guys who joined. Uh, we look forward to seeing you guys again. Have an awesome weekend. And we'll see you next time on Speed Bumps Live. Yeah. Everybody be well. Take care. Bye-bye.